Good morning, Dr. Joe. It's uh, good really morning, Carlos. Really a pleasure to be here with you again. See you again after we saw each other in, in Bogota in January 2020. It was fantastic. It was a fantastic workshop. It really, for me and for my family, it really changed my life. I, I want to ask you, uh, this couple of years, how's been your work? How's been your research? How, what have you done? Uh, because I, I recall you saying that you were working on a future research, especially in the field of immunology. What, what has happened? Well, I think, you know, one of the most profound things that's happened in our, our work is witnessing the testimonials of people who have actually applied the principles and the tools uh, to make changes in their lives. And, and we started noticing about uh, eight to 10 years ago that people were having dramatic changes in their health, uh, cancers, diabetes, MS, lupus, Parkinson's disease, all kinds of autoimmune conditions. And, and when you see those type of changes that take place in people's bodies or in their lives, uh, the scientist in me says, we have to measure to see what's going on. And so probably in the last three years, we really organized a team of scientists from uh, universities that are interested in demystifying the process. We've done over 18,000 brain scans. We've measured over 10,000 uh, HRV heart measurements. Uh, we've done the largest studies on meditation in, in the world. Uh, and we've measured gene expression. We've measured probably 3,000 different metabolites that are excreted from cells to determine whether a cell is in a state of growth and repair or, in, or upregulated or uh, cells are in a state of breakdown or what's called downregulated. We've measured immune function. We've measured um, telomere lengths, which determine a person's true biological age. And our interest is really to see if we can capture things that tell us that um, the, there is a, a power within us that could actually heal. And the scientific research that we've done uh, in those last, uh, primarily last three years, tell us without a doubt that you can make your brain work better in just a few days if you learn the tools and the techniques. Uh, you could actually change your physiological function in terms of your heart rate by changing your emotional state. You could change your immune uh, system strength by trading fear for gratitude and you can train people to do that. You could make the cells of your body through meditation look like it's in a completely different environment and upregulate genes for health. So this isn't just pseudoscience. This is common people that are doing the uncommon. And the cool thing about it is in a very short amount of time, like learning anything, if you keep practicing, you'll get better at it. And so we have great evidence in our scientific studies and we have great evidence in human testimony. And the evidence, I think, is what's uh, causing people to be so excited about what's happening. And, and um, there's a strong interest in the world right now that people want to make changes within themselves without relying on anything outside of them. And I think that's true empowerment. And that's my interest. I want to tell you a short story. Uh, about seven and a half years ago, I, I, one, one day I, I woke up without feeling half of my body. And I got admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of cytomegalovirus meningitis. And my immune system was completely off. My CD4 was 180, I believe. So, of course, they thought I, I had AIDS and probably something was going on. After they looked for everything, AIDS, leukemia, uh, myelomas, lymphomas, everything, they did a PET scan, nothing showed up. The only real, the only thing that was real is that I had the bug in my brain, that it was admitted to the hospital for almost 40 days. And then I got out of the hospital without no diagnosis. Just, yeah, you had meningitis, but why? No, no, no clue. So I had to, to take care of myself. And I had to look in the mirror and say, okay, man, this is between you and I. 
this is between you and I. And of course, I had to uh, reevaluate everything that I was doing, making my relations, my relation with me, with a relationship, uh, a relation uh, that I had before. Of course, I, I had to quit that relation. And um, but still, it was the way of, of the way that I was relating to myself, to my emotions, to my beliefs. And uh, I started reevaluating and making everything different in my life. I, I already did what I do today. I, I studied functional medicine and I've been, I've been doing research and practicing uh, in nutrition. Before, before I, I did functional medicine, I was trained in surgery. I studied journal surgery. But I've, I've always been in love with nutrition and that's mostly in what I've focused on. Um, but then I said, you know, there's something else. I mean, you, you, nutrition, it's a lot, but it's not everything. And by then, nutrition wasn't going to take me anywhere. And that's when I, when, where I found, when I started looking for my unconscious mind, for my conscious, where I started looking for different things. And when I went to the workshop in, in Bogota, that's where everything popped. Till then, my immune system was better, but it wasn't 100% better. It was maybe 80% of the, of the cell count. I had no infections ever after, nothing. After I started meditating, combining meditation, good sleep, nutrition, exercise, changing the way I was relating with everything else. I had my bone marrow biopsy, which was the last one because that's really painful. I had it this past February and everything was great. I was asking you about the, about, um, the switch that you were seeing in immunology because we always see immunology just on like the only solution it's pharmaceutical mm. and um again as you as you've said the that the, the most miraculous and fantastic changes in in patients is when they know when they remember or with or when you tell them and they really realize that the most powerful switch in their lives for their health is in them in their in their choices and for me, that's what I'm focusing on. I, I don't teach meditation. I'm just learning. But it's something that I really encourage people in doing. And I really encourage people on meditating, sleeping well, doing nutrition, exercising. And, and it's really fascinating. I really wanted, wanted to tell you that. I wanted mm. to tell you that, that it's been, for me personally, as a physician, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not my own physician. I'm, I'm just Carlos treating myself as a regular human being and that yeah. it's something that I really try to inspire and encourage people to do it. Well, you know, I, I, I think for the audience, it makes sense that uh, there are three types of stress. There's physical stress, there's chemical stress, and there's emotional stress. And stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of balance, out of normal homeostasis. And the problem with stress is that when we perceive a threat or a danger or we're responding to something in our life that's unfavorable, that primitive nervous system switches on and it mobilizes all of the body's resources to survive and, and adapt to whatever that fear is, whether it's real or imagined. And, and the emotions that come along with the hormones of stress, anger, and frustration and impatience and resentment and fear and anxiety and pain and suffering and guilt and shame. Those are all the emotions that are derived from the hormones of stress. And when you mobilize all that energy, it's because you're switching on an innate system that's causing us to be more protected in our outer environment. Uh, but there's a balance that has to take place between when we're switching on that external protection system, if we keep doing that, there's no energy for our internal protection system, and that's our immune system. So I agree, if you get the body more physically balanced by exercising and sleeping better and, 
and uh, doing acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, whatever you really like to get your body tuned in. And you take care of your body chemically by making the right food choices and eating foods that are not a stress to the immune system, taking vitamins and minerals. That's really great, balancing your blood sugar. But the emotional stress always seems the most difficult for human beings. And one of the key principles that we teach in this work is called self-regulation, to teach people not that they respond to conditions or problems in their lives. That's, that's, everybody reacts emotionally. But the fundamental question is, how long are you going to stay in that emotional state? Because if you start thinking about your problems, you start thinking about past events that occurred in your life, you produce the same chemistry as if you were actually in the real life event. Now, here's the big problem, Carlos. The body doesn't know the difference. It's so objective. It can't tell the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and the emotion that the person's creating by thought alone. So the person's knocking their brain and body out of health or out of balance just by thought alone. So that means then the long-term effects of those hormones and emotions of stress push the genetic buttons that create disease. And if you can think about your problems and turn on that response, your thoughts can literally make you sick. So if your thoughts can make you sick, is it possible that your thoughts can make you well? So we did a study where we took uh, 117 people and we measured their what's called heart rate variability. And that tells you, well, exactly. It's going to tell you whether your heart is in a very healthy state of balance, or when you're zenful and you're impatient and you're frustrated, it's switching on like the fight or flight system, but you're not running and you're not fighting and you're not hiding. And the heart starts beating against the closed system and it starts beating out of order. So we said, okay, let's measure a chemical called IgA, immunoglobulin A. It's the body's primary defense against bacteria and viruses. In fact, you know this as a physician, it's, it's the body's natural flu shot. It's better than a flu shot. So we measured people's IgA levels at the beginning of four days. We told them trade fear, trade anger, trade pain and suffering. Just, you can, you can just trade that and let's teach you how <clears throat> to feel gratitude, to feel love, to feel appreciation. And let's monitor your heart so that we can tell you whether you're actually doing it or not with a sophisticated instrument that feeds a computer and we can see if a person can change their emotional state. Well, when they start opening their heart and they learn how to breathe and change their physiology, just in four days of doing that, their IgA levels went up 50%. That's amazing. Now, that's, that's, if a pharmaceutical company happened to come across something that strengthened IgA by 50%, it would be on every commercial during the news. Yeah. And the point is that's so fundamentally important here is that if you really give a moment to think about this, the person never took anything, ingested anything from outside of them to make those chemicals. Where did those chemicals come from? <laughs> it came from within them. It came from the yeah. point right within them. So Your the, own pharmacy. Right. So now here's a person's living in a state of gratitude or a state of love. The body's so objective in the same exact, same exact understanding that when they live in that state, the body's believing it's living in a favorable environment instead of a threatening environment. And now the internal protection system starts switching on and it starts saying, this is a time for growth and repair. This is a time for long-term building projects. And now the internal protection system, which is the immune system, all of a sudden starts increasing its resources for internal protection. And we've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people with everything from residue from infections to residue with viruses, from cancers to autoimmune diseases, from rheumatoid arthritis, just by balancing their internal state the body's innate capacity to heal steps in and does what it's supposed to do. And that's bring the body back into homeostasis and balance. And, and you're the example that it's possible. How have you watched and or do you have any experience on how meditation 
can improve, switch, change, uh, have any effect on the microbiota and on the microbiome. And that relationship that now you were talking about autoimmune disease and now that we know that the microbiome is so important um, in, in autoimmune disease, what is your experience in that? Or have you done any research in that? Sure. Well, I think, you know, if you really, really take a moment and think about the microbiota, you, you realize that there's actually more cells in your body that are not you yeah. than the cells that make up you. Now, if you I mean, if a person really takes a moment and think about that, these, these are, this is supposed to be a symbiotic relationship, like a win-win yeah. situation. The constant competition that's taking place between good bacteria and bad bacteria is, is what determines whether we're going to be healthy or well, because those bacteria, if certain um, colonies or certain species of those bacteria because of pesticides, because of soil depletion, because of antibiotics, because of whatever environmental cues that are causing it, cause certain colonies to grow. Well, they secrete, cells secrete all kinds of information. And a lot of times that information is very toxic uh, to the body. So in January of this year, we conducted the largest study on microbiomes uh, ever done uh, in the history of you know, this kind of field. <clears throat> we had 1,000, just a little under 1,000 people that came to a week-long event, and we took samples from their microbiome at the beginning of the event, and then they went through seven days of intense training and meditation. And we are looking at the now microbiome and the gene expression of those, of those microorganisms. And I'm uh, in San Diego, California right now, and we're running a week-long event. And the university that we work with is the University of California, San Diego, which is right down the street from where we are right now. And the scientists that uh, are performing the study are just looking at the data right now. And I had uh, dinner uh, the other night with one of them, and I said, you have to tell me something. You can't, because it's, you know, they're, they're studying <laughs> the next right now. He said, well, I can tell you what I'll show you on Saturday will blow your mind. Now, the same exact principle happens. The, the bad bacteria secrete certain chemicals that suppress the good bacteria, and the good bacteria secrete certain chemicals that, that, you know, control the bad bacteria. And he said there was a dramatic shift in healthy bacteria uh, that take place in the body. And it's no different than understanding that when the body moves back into balance and homeostasis and the person gets chemically balanced, physically balanced, and emotionally balanced, then the body is going to thrive in really, really wonderful ways. So we have all this data. We haven't, we haven't really crunched or finished interpreting the data, but stay tuned because it is the largest study that's ever been done on the human microbiome with a thousand people. Do, do you have any, have you performed or, or done anything with people being overweight and obese that, that they weren't able of losing weight in a, in a normal way by diet and exercise? And once they start meditating, the switch really turned different? It is. I, I believe it actually is, in fact, a switch. And people who have um, challenges with, with weight, um, uh, sometimes there's a very strong uh, component that has to do with emotions. And, and, and if a person can really over... Well, let's, let's break it down really simple. There have been a lot of people in this work that have a, tr a dramatic change in their health and in their body just by doing nothing different than meditation, which, uh, and I have been approached by many people who said, I did every diet, I did this, I did that, I could never lose weight until I started doing this work. And once again, why does that happen? Because if the person eats well and the person exercises and does all the right things and they can't make uh, any shifts in their body, <laughs> there's an emotional component that keeps the body in the past. Why is that? Because the end product of experiences in our life are our emotions, right? 
And the stronger the emotions we feel from some events in our life, the more, the more we remember the event. Uh, and so the person a lot of times or people a lot of times get branded emotionally from very strong or highly, highly uh, emotional events in their lives. And they live by that emotion and they get so used to living by that emotion that they think that it's them, right? And so your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And your personality creates your personal reality. So then if you really think about that, it means that if I want to create a new personal reality, if I want to change my life, that means I'm going to have to change or I'm going to have to change my personality. And so then nothing changes in our life until we make those changes. So when a person decides to change their life, the first step that we find so valuable is this concept in neuroscience called metacognition. And metacognition is a function of the frontal lobe. It's the seat of our conscience. And when we truly want to change, the hardest part about change is starting to make different choices. And when you make a different choice, the body all of a sudden is out of its routine known way of doing things and it feels uncomfortable, right? So when you start thinking about what you're thinking about, when you start noticing how you're acting and speaking, and you can really, really pay attention to how you're feeling, the act of becoming conscious of your unconscious states of mind and body is the real fundamental way that we change. It's an unlearning process. It's a breaking the habit process. It's unmemorizing emotions. So if a person starts changing their emotional state, Carlos, without a doubt, they're going to change their physiology <laughs> because emotions are a function of hormones. And hormones are a function of neuropeptides. And neuropeptides are a function of neural networks. And so... Uh, you have a thought, thought signals the limbic brain, the limbic brain makes a neuropeptide, and then all of a sudden you feel angry and your, your adrenal centers turn on. You have a thought, produces different batch of neuropeptides, you feel guilt, that's a different hormonal center. And so then when people start to unlearn that personality and they stop thinking the same way and they stop acting the same way and they stop feeling the same way, there's a biological change that happens in their circuitry, in their neurochemistry, in their hormones, and even in their gene expression. Now, so that's not the end. That's the beginning, and that's the hardest part for most people because 95% of who we are by the time we're in our middle life is a set of memorized behaviors or habits, automatic emotional reactions, hardwired thoughts and attitudes that function automatically. So then... When they function automatically, it means that you, you're unconscious to those thoughts. And becoming conscious of those unconscious thoughts, those unconscious behaviors, how we even speak and how we feel is the process of change. But then if you said, how do I want to think? What thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? What behaviors do I want to demonstrate today in my life? Let me think about with my eyes closed before I grab my cell phone how I'm going to be with my children, how I'm going to be with my coworkers, how I'm going to be in my relationship, how I'm going to be by myself, how am I going to, how am I going to demonstrate greatness? Well, how's it, what's it going to look like to demonstrate love today? The act of closing your eyes and rehearsing it mentally, the brain doesn't know the difference between the real life experience that, or what you're imagining. And you start, you start installing hardware in the brain. And if you keep doing it enough times, it becomes more automatic, like a software program. Now, I think the most important part about this is we have to teach our body emotionally what it feels like to have a change in our life. <laughs> we can't wait for the change in our life or our, our weight loss to, to feel joy or to feel gratitude uh, because uh, we're waiting for something outside to change to feel the emotion of the experience. That's 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 how that's that's a separation. But if we could feel the emotion of how we would feel if we really started making changes in our health or in our diet or in our, our weight or whatever it is or in our, or our new life, you have to open your heart and feel an elevated emotion. Now, what does that do? That brings the body back into a different hormonal state. That brings the body back into a different physiological state.
So if the person practices the unlearning process and starts relearning and reinventing a new self and how they think and how they act and how they feel, so many times, if they keep doing it enough times, our research shows that they're going to change their brain and body to look like they're a different person. And so then a new personality is different than the old personality that had difficulty with weight or whatever. And it's no different than the person with stage four cancer who stands on the stage and I say to them, you have no cancer in your body. Where did the cancer go? Where, where is it? And they say, it's in the old personality. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. belong, it doesn't belong there. So the process of change then, uh, crossing from the old self to the new self, there's a period of time where you have the body has to transform and change and you have to show up every day and you got to keep reminding yourself of who you no longer want to be and you got to keep reminding yourself about who you do want to be and you got to do that before you start your day and then you have to stay in that personality your entire day the people who make dramatic changes in their health and we interview thousands of these people they'll tell you it was no longer about healing their disease <laughs> it was about changing Change, making the changes in the way they think, the way they act, and the way they feel. And they understood if they keep changing, their disease will change. Yeah. So the process was no longer about, I want to heal. The process was, what do I need to change about myself to heal? Now, the game becomes very differently because then you start looking at anything that stands in the way between you and whatever future you want to create. And you keep showing up for yourself and doing the work. You start feeling really worthy after a while that you should you deserve the outcome and i think the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving and and many people as a side effect of their change they lose 15 kilos they their their pain in their body goes away their inflammation goes way down um their eyesight improves their their or, you know their their cancer goes away it's just it, it, their eyesight and hearing comes back we we've, we've seen all kinds of crazy things as a result of personal change and transformation i i was i was told and i know that you you've been working on a on a topic that is the topic of radiant light <laughs> on on saying that that every atom every molecule every cell is radiant light what's yeah. that I think it's fascinating. Well, if you look at information biology, you know, you know, you, you and I, uh, when we studied uh, cellular biology, you know, you, it was this kind of this mechanistic model, like charged molecules do this, and but who's really uh, controlling the functions that are taking place within the cell and from cell to cell? And some of the research that really fascinates me is around information biology. And what most people don't know is that cells actually emit light. They emit energy. They emit a frequency. And frequency carries information. And it's that light that is around the cell that is informing the cell uh, with certain functions. And, and the communication that takes place within the cell and from cell to cell with this frequency happens to be faster than the speed of light. Now, anything that's faster than the speed of light is a quantum phenomenon. So, so when cell resources, they lose their light. And when they lose their light, there's not enough information for them to function properly. When that autonomic nervous system moves into that level of order and those very high, high, elegant frequencies, the cells all of a sudden are getting energy, <clears throat> and energy is information. And so we teach people how to raise the resonant light in their, in their cells. And, uh, and the side effect of that, of course, is a biological upgrade. And it's no different than anything else that you practice. If you practice suffering, you're going to get really good at it, so good at it, you can do it automatically. So is that by the same means, if you can practice changing the frequency of your body by practicing raising your energy, it will emit more radiant light. And when it does, cells communicate uh, between each other and the information the cells have are greater instructions for health and order. And so as an example, we have sophisticated machines at the university that measure 
the amount of energy that takes place in the mitochondrial cells of cancer cells. And cancer cells want to do two things. They want to move and they want to replicate. And that takes a lot of energy. And so the mitochondria in cancer cells, are, it's very, very high. They're at mitochondrial, and that's the powerhouse of the cell. Well, when we started looking at the blood of advanced meditators, and we took the blood of advanced meditators and subjected the uterine cancer cells, and we looked at the amount of energy in the mitochondrial function, we saw a 70% reduction <laughs> in the cancer cell. So now... <clears throat> Dramatic change, a dramatic change in the health of the cell. But it also correlates with the person who's on the stage who had stage four uterine sarcoma that no longer has a uterine sarcoma. That would be a good explanation scientifically of how that happened. But if you take the serum of the advanced meditator and you put it in the presence of a, a neuron that has the gene for Alzheimer's, that same blood will downregulate the gene for Alzheimer's <clears throat> because there's some type of information in the blood. You take a virus like a pseudovirus that looks like SARS-CoV-2 virus, or you take the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and you subject that virus to the plasma of advanced meditators, there's a resistance from the virus from entering the cell. It won't enter the cell. We've isolated the protein that actually inhibits the entrance of the pseudovirus or a virus, the spike protein, into the cell of advanced meditators. Now, this is not common information, but it's because the cells have the energy to, to yes. resist anything from the environment. Now, well, how does that work? Well, really simple. If you're reacting and responding to your environment all the time, then your response from that person or traffic or the news or whatever, that response is actually weakening the organism. That's what that response does. So then if the person's not responding to their environment and they're changing their inner environment, and it makes sense then they're greater than the environment. They should have a resistance or an immunity to things in their environment, small and large. And so our experiments point the finger at this concept of the cell having radiant light, having more energy. The healthy cells have more energy, and for some reason, the un unhealthy cells tend to lose their energy, and it's, and it's, it's a quite an quite a ama amazing phenomenon. Dr. Joe, this has been really fascinating, and um, I really look forward into something that I, I don't want to do in the quantum field, but in the physical field. And it's to enjoy something that I know that you really appreciate and enjoy. And I know that you do it as much as I do, which is wine. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a wine drinker, studier, lover. It's something that I really enjoy. Is it, is it something that you really uh, try to enjoy as much? Yes, yes. I grew up in an Italian family. My, my grandfather was a winemaker and I... I... I've been, I, I have been sampling wine since I was five years old, and uh, oh my God. <laughs> uh, I, I love wine. I love food. I love the combination of two. I've, I've, I've studied uh, quite, quite in depth on the benefits of, of red wine uh, uh, for the for the body uh, and the brain actually as well. And I love the taste of it, and I love doing it with people who love doing it also. I look forward into that, and looking forward forward also into maybe we could we could chat sometime about the benefits on on wine and maybe people encourage people and if they want it they, they want to make it as a healthy habit sometimes maybe they can make it thank you for your time thank you for your generosity thank you for your work you're really a game changer it's really your work is truly truly inspiring and truly it's a gift for humanity and i hope we can meet each other again Sure, Carlos. Thank you for all that you do also and the lives that you change. I appreciate that too. And well, the best for you, best for your family. And thank you. And uh, till next time. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you too.